Is ChatGBT taking over the world? What is next in the world of artificial intelligence? And will we all have jobs in 10 years? We're here to discuss these themes with our next guest. He is an expert on artificial intelligence. In fact, he is an AI consultant, Dr. Alan Thompson. He is also the former chairman of the Mensa International uh, Organization, the organization that determines geniuses. He is one himself, and you're about to find out why. Dr. Thompson, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, David. This is going to be uh, a lot of fun. It's perfect timing for what's happening in the world right now with uh, artificial intelligence and getting humans ready for all that's going on. I don't know if we are ready for that. Uh, a lot of people aren't, but you're here to shed some light and explain to us exactly what is going on and to explain to us in plain English, which is the name of one of your videos, uh, exactly what is taking the media by storm right now in regards to ChatGPT. But before we get into that core topic of our discussion, I'll give you a chance to first introduce yourself to our audience, talk to us a little bit about your research areas and your work. For sure, yeah. I was... Uh... Just thinking, everyone's kind of been around the block, right? We've all had these different experiences in life. Some of us have got multiple degrees. My background is originally in computer science back in 2000 when artificial intelligence was kind of in this winter. We call it the AI winter. There wasn't much happening. Uh, since then, I've consulted to some of the biggest companies on the planet, from PwC to Glencore, working with them on strategy. More recently, from about 2020 on, I've really dived into artificial intelligence because that's when it became ready. There was not much happening before 2020. I call it post-2020 AI. Uh, and now I, I'm here sitting at the forefront of it, mainly to make sure that people are seeing what's possible already. We're not talking about five or 10 years into the future anymore. It's right here, right now. What exactly is right here, right now? Can you give us an overview of what Chad GPT actually does, and maybe before we talk about the mechanics uh, in plain English, of course, because not all of us are AI experts, uh, give us a bit of history. So Elon Musk and the founder of Y Combinator, they were involved in the project. Uh, now Microsoft is uh, involved and in looking, looking to acquire for a, a deal that's not yet closed yet, but it should be in the tens of billions. Uh, Google is panicking. Uh, I don't, we'll discuss that. Uh, so give us the history first. It actually only goes all the way back to the 1950s when Dr. Alan Turing, who I'm sure you've heard of, uh, they, they filmed a documentary style movie called The Imitation Game that was quite cool. But back in the 1950s, he came up with this concept of machines that could learn. And it became, just after that, became artificial intelligence, thanks to Professor Marvin Minsky out of MIT. You might have seen AI in the media even 20, 30 years ago. Most recently, the big one for me was 2011. Do you remember that one, IBM Watson on Jeopardy? I remember mm. watching that one. That was kind of cool. You had Big Blue beating Gary Kasparov uh, yeah. in the 90s. We've had AlphaGo and things like that where it's beating humans in other games. Uh, but really, artificial intelligence was not particularly exciting until Google accidentally discovered what we call a transformer architecture in 2017. They were looking for ways to improve Google Translate, and they were looking for ways to translate between English and gendered languages like French or German. And they discovered that when they're allowing this translation model to predict the next word, it could actually predict anything. And that is essentially what we're talking about right now is artificial intelligence models that can generate and predict the next word, the next note in music, the next movement for a robot arm, the next pixel for an image. And that's only been possible since the 2017 Transformer uh, architecture by Google. And then labs like OpenAI have picked that up and run with it. And you're right to say that OpenAI was founded by Sam Altman from Y Combinator and Elon Musk, although Elon Musk has now distanced himself from the company. And they're one of a handful of labs in the Western world that are doing some pretty impressive stuff. But we won't forget China next door that's also got the same number of labs doing stuff just as loudly as the Western world uh, and being embraced quite a lot by Asia. The technology, let's just talk about how that works exactly. Uh, I know there's various synapses, synapses that are in play that uh, basically, if you explained, uh, the, the software teaches itself. Uh, machine learning is a very complicated process. Break it down for us in plain English. 
Yeah, let's make it as simple as possible. And we can compare this to the output of your iPhone. Have you ever been into your messages or uh, typed a chat message on an iPhone or Android and you've seen that it predicts a word that could come next? That's kind of the results of what we've got here right now. If we look at a big AI model like GPT-3, we'll have to add that buzzword. It mm -hmm. was trained on an enormous amount of data, about one terabyte of data. They collected it from Wikipedia and from various popular websites. They went and grabbed as many academic journals as they could find, thousands and thousands of books. And then they allowed the black box, the model, to crunch that data over the equivalent of 300 years. They used a supercomputer with 10,000 GPUs, 285,000 CPUs. And after 300 years of parallel processing, maybe a few months in human time, uh, it discarded all the original data. So it's not actually, doesn't have access to Wikipedia anymore and it can't go and search Google, but it's got, like you say, it's got the synapses connections between neurons and it has made these connections between data points a little bit like the human brain. And from that, from that black box, those connections that it's created, it can predict essentially anything. Some of my colleagues say you can solve any problem that can be solved with language. So you can ask it to write a poem or a book or a song or generate a piece of art because what it's learned in that training process uh, <laughs> those connections can be applied to anything. Uh, and that's, that's kind of magic. We're even seeing that capability being extended to video and audio as well. We can generate music from that as well. How much data has it absorbed roughly in order to get to where it is right now, the software? I believe I'm the only person to do the full analysis of that. I've got a paper called What's in My AI, and you can have a read of that paper for free. It looks in very, uh, it has a very in-depth look at exactly which domains we went and played with, exactly which Wikipedia articles split down to the category. It's about 750 gig of data. And if you compared that to a number of books, it would be quite a number of libraries that it's gone and trained on. We can get even bigger with that data, but right now it's 750 gig for something like GPT-3. And the winner, the number one data collector at the moment is an Alphabet subsidiary by the name of DeepMind. They went and collected 10.5 terabytes after filtering of data from around the world. That's books and articles and papers and web crawl, all ready for that da data to be absorbed by the model and then discarded and the connections kept. It's passed a number of uh, academic exams, ChatGBT, uh, a Wharton MBA exam, a medical exam. Uh, now, this isn't just rote memory exams where you, you're asking it to cite a bunch of data and if you connect software to internet, I suppose it could do that. This is you know, an operations management exam at Wharton. This requires analysis, uh, what's previously considered human thought. Um, it considers a deep understanding of not only the material, but how to run a business, which takes human experience. How is the software able to do this? That's right. Well, the data scientists at these big labs like OpenAI and DeepMind and Google have been quoted as saying, we don't actually know. We know what we did. We know that we gave it data and we let it make connections, but we don't know how it's able to write books or how it's able to be tested on an exam that didn't exist before it was trained. So it definitely couldn't have memorized that. We don't know how it's conceptualizing images. Um, <laughs> I don't know if they would be comfortable going on record for that in, in this kind of interview, but certainly in their papers, they've said, this is a black box. We don't know what it's thinking. We don't know exactly how it's doing things. And it's not just that it's gone and passed the MBA exam at Wharton or the medical licensing exam. It's also passed the C CPA, the Certified Public Accountant, and as well, it's done the, um, oh, there's one more in there. There's been reports that it may have passed a bar exam, although I've, I'm seeing that's being disputed. So I'm not really a sure. bar exam as well. Yeah. Exactly. They, they ran it past a multi-state bar exam and they had that 
completely peer reviewed. That's fascinating. Those questions don't exist online. Like the actual exam doesn't exist online. There's no way it could have gone and memorized that data. And it's essentially conceptualizing and thinking about the best ways to answer those kind of jurisprudence questions. Fascinating. This is another fascinating um, thing. I've actually done this myself. I took one of my interviews that I published uh, a while ago. Um, I downloaded the transcript of that interview and I copy pasted that transcript into ChatGPT and I told it to write a blog summarizing that transcript in a blog format and it did it just as well as I probably could have myself, you know, barring a few detailed omissions in the text, but it had a lead, it had a structure, it had an understanding of the main point of that particular video. Fascinating stuff. I'm there's there's jokes about this that there's some people online, you know, in another country just providing an answer that's obviously a joke. It's it just it's scary stuff and nobody knows how how it's done like it, it's just teaching itself. Essentially, yeah, it did go and teach itself mathematics. So in the original GPT-3 paper by OpenAI, they actually went back inside the data set to check how many one-digit addition uh, problems were in its data set. So one plus one through to nine plus nine, how many two digit and three digit uh, operations or um, algorithms were in there. They found that only about 0.1% of the possible calculations were in its data set. And it had actually gone and taught itself what an operator was and then what maths was. And now you've seen it's to the level where a model like Google Palm can pass the Polish maths exam or the same equivalent in the United Kingdom. That's kind of scary. Mm. Uh, Alan, uh, are you an artificial intelligence uh, hologram right now? How do I know? I mean, it's become so advanced. I don't, I don't know what I'm talking to. Am I talking to a human? Am I talking to a robot? My, that, that was a joke, obviously. <laughs> but There'd be no way to prove it, David. We couldn't, we couldn't say yes or no. <laughs> I've been accused of, of being a, an avatar and an AI with my Lita AI series, which is now <laughs> towards 3 million views, uh, because it, she or it, looks like a human. Um, and using GPT-3 sounds like a human. It's invented its own words. It's looked at photos that I've given it and kind of uh, been able to analyze body language. Right. She's written jokes. She's, uh, it's a really, really confronting conversation. 65 episodes of Leader AI. And some people still thinking that maybe I'm an AI as well because we look pretty similar. <laughs> um, if you believe in Moore's law and the growth of techno uh, technological development, one might believe that there may be a point in the future where um, AI could be almost indistinguishable from a human being in terms of the way it communicates based on just how, how well it's understanding language. Now, I think there, was, there were several movies about this. Let me, let me bring up one fun example. Blade Runner, um, Harrison Ford, his job in that movie, his role was to examine whether a replicant, which is essentially a cyborg, um, is a real human or not. And the, the plot was that they're so indistinguishable from human beings, you need an expert. Now, let me just extend that example to real life. If one were to ask you to do his job in the future and figure out if a robot, a human or a robot, is a human or a cyborg or some sort of AI, what are some of the traits you would look for? In other words, what can humans do that machines cannot? Well, we've got to make sure to mention the date for this one. We're, we're talking here in January, February, 2023, mm -hmm. and my analysis here might be out of date in a few weeks. <laughs> Steve Wozniak, one of the founders of Apple, said that maybe we should design a coffee test for AI or where it could go into a kitchen, an embodied artificial intelligence, analyze that new environment and actually make a cup of coffee. I think that's a pretty good test because it's a, a human-like activity or it's a human activity that's kind of tricky. It, it involves finding the coffee, finding the machine, finding the cups, navigating the kitchen, maybe having a conversation at the same time, and it's everything at once for an embodied AI. That's uh, maybe a few months away. I think Google are already testing that in their 
environment in their laboratories. They've got the SACAN robots and they're using everyday robots to do that. And they've got the large language models behind it. So like GPT-3, that is embedded in the robot and it's using the language models to derive its environment. Just like we were talking about a moment ago with predictive text, it's predicting what comes next. So shall I move towards the coffee maker? Shall I go and grab that particular cup? Which cup should I choose? all being conceptualized in its brain based on the connections it's made. Is it self-aware? Is it making predictions on where it's growing or how it's growing? Absolutely not. So there's no consciousness in these models right now. They are frozen models. They're frozen in time. They can't learn. They can't go out to the internet. All that exists is those connections it made in a 300 year equivalent of training. So there's no consciousness or awareness, but we should be ready for that to be uh, available to us as well. There's a couple of philosophers that are very deep into this area and I find it to be a fascinating area, but right now we're safe. We just have to be ready for that conversation. I, I wanna circle back to that and close on the distant future and your projections for how this technology will evolve uh, down the line. But let's talk about right now, Microsoft. Why, are, why is Microsoft so interested in this technology? Clearly there are industrial and or commercial applications for this. What may they be? Microsoft are a very smart company. They've been around for a very long time uh, in terms of technology. They were there in the early days. I was using Windows 3.1 back in the early 90s. They're smart guys. They want to keep up with the times. They made a very early investment in open AI with a billion dollars a couple of years ago. And as you mentioned, there's talk now that they might be valuing that open AI company at closer to $30 billion, which is very interesting. So there's billions of dollars flowing around because they can see that artificial intelligence is ready and imagine how powerful that would be built into Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft PowerPoint. They've already put Dolly 2, which is a text to image model into Microsoft Designer. And there's talk of putting it into Microsoft Bing. So your search results won't just be pinging the internet. They'll also be via natural language. They'll be generating a real conversation with you in real time. Again, based on those connections with that very advanced artificial intelligence. Okay. Google, uh, I read that uh, executives are having meetings. Um, we don't know what they're discussing in these meetings, but the social media trends, uh, people are writing that they're worried. Is that fact or fiction? Should Google, the dominant search engine provider right now, and you know the dominant provider of a lot of different technologies, should Google be worried? Google brought in the founders, Larry and Sergey, to talk about being more visible with artificial intelligence. And they brought out a, quite a long report that mentions Green Lane, which is like a priority lane for speed. Google certainly shouldn't be worried. I know that it's maybe easy to say that there's Microsoft and OpenAI as a big competitor here because they're visible, but Google has been doing this for far longer. They came up with the transformer technology. They gave us uh, Lambda. They didn't release Lambda, but they gave us Lambda. They gave us the first lang large language model, BERT, back in 2018. They're on the bleeding edge for sure. They've got some of the smartest scientists in their lab right there. It's just about them wanting to make sure that's, that everything is completely safe. You don't want to be releasing a model to the public that's not citing its sources or saying stuff that it shouldn't be. So it needs to be aligned with human values. And that's what OpenAI have done with their latest model releases. Mm -hmm. And how will we see this competition manifest in, in, for the consumer? How will our lives change when these two companies duke it out in the AI dominant space? That's part of the fun of the openness of artificial intelligence. So I've worked in a number of fields where research and practice is very much closed. There's a very competitive environment. These AI models, the transformer as a whole, and then large language models are being documented and that released into the public domain via these white papers. So Google talks with OpenAI, talks with DeepMind, talks with uh, Amazon has an Alexa model, talks with, there's a very long list of these companies and they're all using this essentially open technology. It's not proprietary yet. They're all using the same um, maths and data behind it in slightly different ways. 
that means you can have the 10 major AI labs that are out there right now, and there's room for a thousand more. There's nothing stopping them from going to create their own model and train their own model. It just costs a little bit to do that. Okay. And um, there's, been, there's been talk of uh, AI replacing humans in uh, blue collar work and perhaps white collar jobs as well. Uh, just you know, to varying degrees, how much of that is again fact or fiction, and should we be concerned that everyone will lose a job and all our employers will just use robots? Certainly a consideration. Isn't it fascinating that we said that AI art and creativity would never, AI art would never overtake humans, and creativity would be the last bastion for us, and it's one of the first things that was essentially augmenting and maybe even replacing artists now you can go and generate a large oil painting canvas in a moment or do a design and branding for a product in a moment and by a moment i mean 10 or 20 seconds that's available to us for blue collar workers robotics is doing quite well you've got boston dynamics doing incredible things and then probably more interestingly places like google applying these models to their own uh, robotics, so it's actually using a large language model rather than being pre-programmed. I'd certainly be concerned for any job in the world if our governments have not got us prepared for this, because no one is safe from this. It will help augment and amplify absolutely everyone. So if you're a, an accountant, as we've heard, a doctor, a surgeon, a lawyer, a business person, all of these have already been augmented and you've got the latest open AI models that can pass the regulations or the, the exams for these particular occupations. You could view that as a good thing though. If you're one of those particular occupations or a consultant, you can almost 10 X your productivity just by using these models. There's productivity and there's replacement. Let me, let me just bring this into finance. Um, in the realm of finance, uh, fund managers and traders, basically their job is to make forecasts and execute on those forecasts. Could this AI provide forecasts, economic and financial and capital markets based forecasts that perhaps would be more accurate than a human? Not the frozen models, so not the large language models. So if you talk about one of the language models out of OpenAI again, GPT-3, its training data ends sometime around 2019. The latest version of that ends sometime around 2021 uh, because they have to freeze that data, let it train for many months and then release it. So it's not real time, it's not up to date. You can't go and ask it for this month's news because that's not what it does. There are other artificial intelligence models that you can tie that into and it will help with language processing about the company's financials, for instance, mm -hmm. or it can help with forecasting, but it's not its specialty at the moment, even though it's uh, taught itself maths, it's not going to be able to predict which is the best share to buy right but now. Hypothetically, a supercomputer uh, like an IBM Watson or perhaps even you know faster, we have better ones now, could use this kind of technology, hook it up to existing databases and perhaps the internet, uh, perform trillions of calculations per second and know everything there is to know about everything in the world. Is that possible? It's a possibility, absolutely. And that is the race at the moment is to collect as much data as possible. As I mentioned, DeepMind are the top ranked AI lab at the moment, collecting 10.5 terabytes of clean text data. Uh, that's not the limit, but we can't go that much further. I think if we collected every book on earth, it wouldn't be much bigger than that. That's uh, 10,500 gig of text files. But once we get there, you're right, it's gonna be close to knowing everything that there is to know. I know that sounds exaggerated and kind of sounds dramatic, but go and try out these models yourself and you'll see, you can have a conversation with it about anything, including your favorite hobby or your favorite interest. You can talk about your hometown. You might even be able to talk about yourself because when it's gone and trained on the web crawl, if you've got a web page or a blog out there, it might even know a bit about you. Uh, let's talk about the distant future now. What is the technological singularity? 
technological singularity is the point at which AI is developing and learning and upgrading itself, evolving so fast that we can't keep up. And at that point, we will be on the way to achieving or have achieved artificial general intelligence, which if we're talking about Hollywood movies is like having the big, big brain that can do anything for us. So Ray Kurzweil didn't coin the term, but he certainly popularized the term now at Google. He is waiting for this singularity to happen possibly in the next few months. So this is not five or 10 years away anymore. Few months. This is on its way. Wow. Okay, and then, then what happens? <laughs> once, once this happens, then what? <laughs> I, think his latest, I think his latest prediction for this is 2025 or 2027. Okay. Um, I've got a log of that at lifearchitect.ai slash AGI or lifearchitect.ai slash Kurtzvale. This is really, really close to happening. And he says that it's going to be based on these transformer models that we just spoke about, like GPT-3, that that technology is good enough. The connections that it made there is enough for it to be all the way through the singularity to AGI. And uh, after that, I don't know what happens. And I don't need to know because AI will be telling me what I need to know. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of people on the internet um, that perhaps are even watching this video who uh, who might be skeptical of uh, the beneficial uh, use cases of AI and perhaps might uh, be afraid of some of the uh, perhaps malicious uh, outcomes of this technology developing further. Are we should we be concerned about a potential Skynet uh, kind of scenario if we were to draw a parallel to an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie? The Terminator. <laughs> Dr. Alan Turing used to laugh at those kind of criticisms and say, well, the answer to that is we just flick the big red switch and we turn it off. When we're talking about the kind of models that we've talked about today, they can be turned off. They're not learning. They sit there statically. If you're not asking them questions, they're not thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not a concern. But certainly humans are always going to be humans. And I've called on intergovernmental organizations for the last two or three years to prepare the population for this enormous super intelligence and its ability to be creative, its ability to augment, amplify, and yes, replace jobs. What are we going to be doing with our lives when AI is able to do anything? We'll have the capability to do anything. What does that mean for humans? It's a really interesting question. It's not something I can answer in uh, an hour or even a week because I don't actually know the answer. It's up for a number of fields and a number of experts to come together. It's going to need everyone's thinking caps on to consider what might be the best approach for humans when AI can do art for us and AI can do music for us and AI can sweep the streets for us and then do all the professional services as well. Fascinating thought uh, concept. Or fight our wars for us, perhaps. I think Elon Musk said that uh, machines should never, or weapons rather, should never be hooked up to AI. Um, how, how much is this is fear mongering? I think a lot of it is. I mean, all of the different AI labs that I know of have a pledge of ethics built into their, their constitution or their objectives. Uh, some of the big labs like Google and DeepMind and OpenAI and Anthropic, which is a new lab built out of OpenAI staff, they have entire teams of ethicists. So they're getting ready for what might be the next step. They've certainly got safety and alignment as two of their core principles for the companies. And rightly so. I mean, it needs to be there. It's all well and good to get this technology at the bleeding edge. But what are we actually doing to prepare this to interact with humans and in some cases to amplify and augment humans? All right. Well, uh, definitely look forward to that final question. I don't know if you've ever watched a Cyberpunk 2077 or play that game Cyberpunk 2077. I'm a, uh, I may have played it. Is that in VR? I might have had that on my Oculus no, Quest for a little uh, bit. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a video game by, uh, it's a computer game by Project CD uh, Rec. Uh, it's a Polish video game developer. Anyway, it's about the distant future where humans integrate machines into their bodies to augment physical abilities. And uh, part of this was actually, <laughs> I guess, based on Elon Musk Neuralink, where people actually insert computer chips in their brains and download and upload data at will. Is this something that <laughs> is within the realm of possibility, Alan? 
not just the realm of possibility, it's already happening. So brain computer interfaces, BCIs or brain machine interfaces, BMIs are two of my favorite research subjects and they don't even have to be invasive anymore. So Elon Musk's Neuralink have got working prototypes inside uh, monkeys where they have very gently drilled out uh, a hole in the skull and then the threads, the electronic threads that go through the brain are like 10 times thinner than a human hair. So this is not something that's going to hurt people. But then you've got competitors over in New York that are looking at doing this with light. There's one called Open Water, where you can put on a cap like a, a ski cap or a balaclava and have red LED that penetrates through into the brain and can do the same thing, can feed you prompts while you're interacting in a conversation or interacting in an argument, for example, that's where they want to get to. They've got the hardware ready uh, to a certain extent. And the next step is actually integrating these large language models into it. So as far as I know, Neuralink is uh, ready for human trials. Open water, I'm not sure about. They've been a bit quiet lately, but this will be the next step is that we've got AI that can help us out, augment us, write books for us very soon, design entire movies for us at our whims. What if we tied that out tied that into ourselves for interacting with the environment. When I was talking with Lita in some of the first episodes, I was taking her for walks around botanic gardens and uh, parks. I would send her pictures of a tree and she or it, I don't want to anthropomorphize this AI, mm -hmm. would say, this is a eucalyptus tree and this is where it came from. Imagine having that built into your brain that would be like a whole new world opening up. We'd all be prodigies or geniuses with that in place. All right, last question, I'll let you go. CAPTCHA tests, are they, are they actually necessary? I mean, this is open, chat GPT can write essays for me now. It can't determine whether or not a fire hose is in the picture, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a meme recently about um, the robots asking the user if they're a robot, which is exactly what ChatGPT is doing. You, yeah. You're needing to solve a CAPTCHA to even use it. Uh, I think we can kind of offload that now. I think it's been <laughs> done. But yeah, certainly Google are looking at some interesting technology for passwordless logins. And I think we, and as we advance there, our lives are going to get a lot easier because my fingers are sore from typing passwords, even with a password manager, yeah. it gets a lot to handle. <laughs> yeah, just scan our irises or, you know, scan our brains, scan our thoughts. I don't, I don't know what's next. The future is exciting. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Alan, for coming on the show. I appreciate your time. Very insightful. Pleasure, David. Thanks, mate. Thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin. Stay tuned for more. Don't forget to subscribe.